Um, so I'm going to be talking about just all these different complex issues associated with CAN coatings. But uh, before I even get started, what I want to do is just go back in time a little bit and tell you how I, I got into this issue because I'm, I'm not a CAN manufacturer and I'm not a CAN chemist. But um, several years ago in my home state of Maryland, there was um, interest in banning polycarbonate baby bottles. And the foundational chemistry for polycarbonate is similar to what we're talking about today. It's bisphenol A. And there was concern about infant exposure to BPA. And the proposal of the legislative ban prompted a lot of conversation among a variety of different groups. And so just to give you an example, the pediatric perspective that I heard was, well, you know, I, I was practicing pediatrics in the day when I was treating lacerations in babies and young children from broken glass. And I don't really want to go back to those days. I'm not really all that excited about glass. There were other concerns that glass bottles, which I think at the time were more expensive than polycarbonate, that um, for people who were financially challenged, this was going to be a big issue for them if we, if we banned polycarbonate. And the thing that got my attention was that there was a new chemistry that had been rolled out to, to function as a replacement for polycarbonate bottles. And I was really curious about this, and so I did what you know we all do. I went into the literature to see what I could find out about this chemical in terms of its toxicity or its leachability or really anything, and I couldn't find anything. And I, I suspect that people in this room could have a really lively debate about BPA toxicity that could go on for you know years, but I think it's inarguable that at least BPA is extremely well studied, and in fact. I'm on East Coast time, so I was up at four. So just for fun, I went into PubMed and I looked in the literature just to see how many articles have been published on bisphenol A. And I didn't try to screen it or refine it, but just typed in bisphenol A and I got over 10,000 hits. So I think it's fair to say it's a well-studied chemical. So here we had this, you know, this issue with polycarbonate that I think kind of resonates in terms of the discussion that we're having today. And the issues that I just mentioned to you led to a, a really short paper that Linda Birnbaum and I put together. It was just meant to be a kind of a two-page introduction to this issue of alternatives and the concept that exposure science can really help us try to develop sort of a systematic framework for not making mistakes, for not leaping out of one chemistry and leaping into another that's going to give us perhaps even more problems or, in my view, maybe even worse, treating us all like guinea pigs because we don't know and we don't understand the chemistry that we're moving to. Now, if you're in exposure science, which again is where I live, and if you're doing any work on BPA, it's really hard to not find yourself somehow thinking about cans. And this is because, as you all know, diet is the major route of exposure for BPA and canned food is a part of our diet. So back before the time that I, that I wrote this, um, I was seeing on the internet a lot of questions and they were usually in really big font, you know, with a lot of exclamation points saying, we don't want BPA in canned food. Why aren't canned manufacturers doing something else? Why aren't they making our food in cans that don't have BPA? And the more I saw this question, the more I thought, you know, it's a really interesting question. Why aren't they doing this? Because manufacturers often like to create things that consumers want. And so what was the holdup? And was there something holding things up? So I did you know, what I do, and I went back to the literature, and I found basically nothing. And so this led me to um, can manufacturing textbooks, of which there are several. And I also got introduced to a few can chemists who were really generous with their time. And then finally, I had the opportunity to visit a can manufacturing plant. And I have to say, if, if if you all are, are really serious about pursuing this particular topic and, and you want to keep going down this road, I urge you to find a way to go to a can manufacturing facility because I assure you it will inform your thinking once you see actually how cans are made. So anyway, what I was asked to do today was to provide some, what I'm thinking of as sort of 10,000 foot level information on cans and can coatings. I was asked to cover why it is that we can foods, um, why do we coat, the cans that we use? What does that food, beverage, can combination really have to do for us? And then just very briefly introduce you to a qualitative framework that I set up for this paper to help me at least think in a systematic way about how to compare across resin types. Um, one vocabulary issue, when I talk about canned food, I also mean canned beverages. I'm just going to use that as a shorthand. And also, I'm going to use linings, coatings, and resins sort of interchangeably. So they don't mean different things. It's just whatever I happen to put up on the slide, really. OK. 
Why canned foods? There's a lot on this slide, but let me just walk you through it. I think most of us, I don't know about Berkeley, maybe this is different here, but most of us don't live in a world where we can just walk to some local place and get local fresh foods year round. We need packaged food. It's an integral part of our international food supply. So first of all, we need packaging that maintains food quality and safety, and cans do that because they're very durable. They also keep out things like bugs. Nobody wants bugs in their food. They protect food against changes that are going to occur through direct, con or sorry, through contact with uh, sunlight. So we use cans for that. We use cans because they're cost effective. I don't know how many people were in the room when that YouTube video was was scrolling through before um, watching how cans were made. So can make cans incredibly rapidly. We use either tin plated steel, which is by the way where the expression tin can comes from. Um, incredibly high speeds of production. So a small facility can produce up to a few million cans a day, and in that video that you were looking at, they were making 1,800 cans per minute. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I think maybe you have the slides and you can just go to this Discovery Channel video. It's very short, and I think it's, it's worth looking at. We can foods because cans are lightweight. We conserve both materials and energy, and I don't think I have to tell anybody in this room why it's important to conserve energy. Um, we need a packaging that's interchangeable. We have so many different kinds of foods and beverages that we need to package somehow, and we don't want to have to create a whole new system of package and coating for every single kind of food. We want something that's going to cut across many foods, and that's a concept called universality, and um, cans, mini cans and can coatings have that property, so it's, again, very desirable. And then finally, we want food security. We don't want to have one bad crop here and make it so that we can't eat. And I know that long shelf life was discussed already, and Dr. Solomon mentioned to me on the phone, this is something Marylanders aren't used to thinking about, but I guess you all have earthquake kits? <laughs> yeah, we, we, don't, we don't do those. So, but apparently, <laughs> yeah. although we did have an earthquake recently, it's very exciting. So, um, so I understand that, that canned food is part of your kit, and how many of you regularly check the, the expiration date on the cans in your kit? A couple of you. I, I think most of us have the expectation that we bring a can home, we stick it on the shelf, and it's going to be there, and it's going to be good until we're ready to eat it. And most of us, I think, don't pay attention to expiration dates. I should speak for myself, I guess. But I think most of us don't. I think that's fair to say. OK, so why do we coat cans? I want to start by saying that not all cans have organic coatings. It really depends on what you're putting in there. So, for example, with a steel can, um, if you put in a light-colored fruit or fruit juice, the tin coating is, is all you need. The tin oxidizes, and that actually helps prevent the fruit from changing its uh, color or its um, flavor. But with many other foods and beverages, they're going to come into contact with the tin, and they're going to corrode it, make their way underneath that tin coating to the steel. They're going to corrode that. They're going to pit away at it and it's going to cause the can to swell and, and damage the can, and it, that allows the introduction of pathogens. And I, I was sharing this with Dr. Solomon before this meeting as well, that um, so I think at the time when I was growing up, I guess fewer cans were coated. And I, I remember my mother eating you know, food out of a can and getting violently sick, and I think you know, once you've seen that kind of thing, you sort of look at cans with a whole new appreciation in terms of safety and the importance of food safety. It's not a, it's not a happy event. Um, OK, so aluminum, similar issue. The aluminum it comes into contact with air and water from the product on the inside. If there is sufficient amount of air in there, it'll form a thin aluminum oxide coating. So that helps protect the whatever is in that can. But if you have a content that is either high or low pH or is salty, it's going to solubilize that aluminum oxide coating. And that will allow corrosion of the aluminum. Again, not something you want. So that's, that's really where we're heading with why we coat cans. So, what does this food beverage coating combination have to do for us? It actually has to do a lot of things. We've already talked about protecting can integrity. From my perspective, that's really the most important thing. Um, we want to make sure that whatever is going in doesn't corrode the metal. And it has to be able to do that even under really harsh conditions. So I didn't realize, actually, that a lot of our foods that we eat, our canned foods, they're actually sterilized in the can before it's sealed. So you've got food sitting in contact with the coating in the can under extremely high temperature for some period of time, and the coating and can combination has to maintain its integrity through that process. I already mentioned expectation of a long half-life. 
It has to be tough enough to prevent the can integrity if it's, bang, if it's uh, dinged or bent. So I know we all have the experience and we think we're being careful and we come home, we're unloading our groceries and we notice our can has a, a dent in it. How many people throw the can away when they see a dent? Okay, a couple of people, but most of us I think put it on the shelf because we assume that the can can handle it. And so that's part of the process of the coating is to help that um, maintain that integrity. And then I already mentioned that it has to survive the manufacturing process, what happens when you put the food in the can, and also just our ambient processes. And it's got to do that without having the coating degrade or peel away from the metal. Okay, it has to protect against food taste and odor. I think a lot of people view this as secondary, but I guess, you know, generally speaking, if it doesn't taste good and no one's going to eat it, then what's the point? Um, the other thing is that organoleptic issues uh, can, off flavors can actually sometimes make people feel sick and then they won't eat the foods and this can actually affect the whole supply chain as well. So it's, it's an important issue. It helps, coatings help protect with the food appearance. So apart from just making the food look better, uh, many foods have sulfur compounds in them and this can interact with the metal substrate and stain the can. And again, this is one of those things that I think we all just and a kind of a gut level understand that if you open a can, you flip open the lid and things don't look right in there, you're not going to eat it. So you need to prevent this kind of staining. Most people aren't going to call their local chemist and try to find out if that staining is okay or not. So um, this can be a real problem and we need to protect against that. And the other specific example, I assume there are some beer drinkers in, in the room. Um, if beer comes in contact with the aluminum, then it's going to make it cloudy and I don't think anybody's going to drink Again, you know, you open up a beer, you pour it in your glass. If it's cloudy, you're going to throw it away. So this is the next thing that coatings have to do. So with this figure, this just came from um, the, the paper, but I put it up here again. It's just kind of a, a, a summary reminder that not all foods are the same. Some have sulfur in them, some are high pH or low pH um, and can attack the walls of the can. And you're not expected to read that text, by the way. This is just a way of reminding people that everything that goes in the can is a little bit different from everything else. And so we have to have a can and coating combination that can withstand that particular item that's going in the can. Now, for the purposes of today's conversation, if you're going to propose a formulation change to a lining, it may actually also require a process change in the manufacturing facility. And so if you're going to require a change to enhance one feature, you have to make sure that you're not adversely impacting some of the other features that we just talked about. So how do we think about this systematically? Again, I, I, I tried to do something very qualitative. Um, so I looked to the US EPA Design for the Environment process for evaluating chemical alternatives. They function on a couple of things in particular. They, they want maintenance of desired functionality because you could find the best lining in the world in, in terms of, say, toxicity, but if it doesn't work, then again, I would ask, what's the point? And then you want to minimize the likelihood of unintended negative consequences, and I think everyone is familiar with this. So I just want to... I mean, kind of staying up at the 10,000 foot level, I just want to dive into the weeds for just a minute and talk about technological feasibility. I already talked about consumer acceptance, organoleptic properties. I don't think we need to talk about that more. And then you'll notice I haven't talked about toxicity. Uh, <laughs> I want to stay away from that. I will simply say that coatings should have minimal and en environmental and health impact, and there's going to be a whole session on that this afternoon. Um, so you can just kind of reserve that for later. So technological feasibility. We talked a lot about corrosion resistance. Every food and beverage has an inherent intensity and type of corrosiveness. And also, storage and processing conditions impact cans and coatings and the contents differently. Now, I went into this really naively. I guess I was thinking that in order to see how long something can stay in a can on a shelf, I thought there was some sort of elegant, sophisticated, QSAR type approach that manufacturers could use to estimate shelf life. And it, it turns out it's actually much simpler than that. Manufacturers put the food in the can and they put it on the shelf. And this is called a pack test. So in these pack tests, they, they'll fill a bunch of cans of the same product and they'll put it on the shelf for the expected shelf life. And this can be years. And this is really important. I want to emphasize this because this goes back to that question I asked in the beginning that I saw on the internet, which is how come you guys can't come up with something right now to replace, you know, what's, what's in a can now? Well, you need to be able to test for shelf life so that you all can put these in your earthquake kits and not worry about it. So they'll put it on the shelf and then they'll open successive cans over time and they'll look inside. 
and they'll look to see whether the coating still looks okay. Is it intact? Has it pulled away from the substrate? Is the food and beverage still okay in terms of taste and appearance and nutrition? And has the can developed any kind of visual problems? So that's the first thing they do. They also do something called an abuse test. So in this case, they, um, they take a coated can and they put an aggressive product in. And I was told actually that salsa is one of the best things for this, which kind of makes you wonder about your, your stomach, but anyway, that's a separate <laughs> issue. But they, they put an aggressive product in, they seal it, and then they damage it near the seam, and they stick it in a, a pot of water with pathogens in it and look to see if pathogens get in. So this is how our food is, is tested in terms of safety and, and, health li and uh, shelf life. Excuse me. So in terms of thinking about uh, how to set up this, this um, approach, this framework for looking across available resins, the first thing that I looked at or wanted to evaluate was fabrication. So this is the mechanical process of can formation. And again, this is why I would urge you to go to a can manufacturing plant, because it's really amazing. The metal is subjected to all kinds of stresses. And oftentimes, the coating is put on earlier in the process, sometimes later in the process. But even if it's pretty late in the process, the can is still going to undergo um, or, or be subjected to processes like thinning of the neck, you know, creating a flange at the top so you can attach a lid. And all of these things um, happen to that metal during which the coating you know, has to survive. So can it survive fabrication? Is it flexible enough and is it tough enough so that it won't do all those things that are shown here, flaking, cracking, shattering, tearing, losing adhesion, or just generally failing? So this is the first thing that you'll see when I show you a figure in a couple of slides on, on um, the framework. Application. You know, there's, I was joking with some before, there's no one sitting on a bench somewhere, you know, putting these coatings on by hand with a paintbrush. This thing happens at extremely high speed. It's got to be easy to use, and it has to stick to the metal substrate. Otherwise, it's going to peel off, and you'll have all the problems that we already talked about. So that's the second feature I looked at. The third was universality. I've already mentioned this. We want a resin that's going to function well with a wide array of food and beverage types. This makes it economically advantageous. So here's, here's the setup, and just to, again, you don't need to see all the, the small details, but I tried to make it sort of user-friendly, so each of these is kind of on a, on a food shelf. So we have corrosion resistance here, fabrication, application, universality, and then the organoleptic properties and appearance. And then across the top are each of the different available kinds of resins, and they're in very major headings because each one of these resins is actually a mixture of a lot of different substances, but this is sort of the basis of the of the coating. And uh, there's a different figure for, um, or a different description for each resin, but I just wanted to focus in on epoxy because I think it'll become apparent why epoxy is used for about 95% of our can coatings. It's extremely corrosion resistant. It's strong and flexible. In terms of fabrication, for most can types, it works really well. There was one can type that, where it didn't seem to work if it was unblended. Um, it adheres well to metal substrates. It's compatible with more food and beverage types than other available resins, and it doesn't impart flavor to foods, and the foods retain their appearance. So I think you know, it becomes pretty clear why it is we use this. If you look at some of the other examples, like, um, I don't know, I'll just pick one you know, at random vinyl, you can see that, the, maybe I should have said the three green cans is, you know, maybe it was obvious, <laughs> the best, <laughs> and the one red can is, is the lowest. And you know, for some of these, you've got, they do really well in certain aspects, but not so well in others, whereas in epoxy, it was, it was pretty much the best all the way down. OK, so just to summarize, for almost all foods and beverages, uncoated cans aren't an option. For each new food, beverage, coating, processing combination, we have to test it. We have to understand if it can withstand fabrication and processing. We have to understand the failure mechanisms. And we have to understand whether or not it's going to have the desired shelf life. If it won't, then there's going to have to be a huge educational campaign to teach people not to keep canned foods on their shelves or their kits. In terms of lead time, and again, this goes back to that question of how come we don't have something right now, the development of a new co uh, coating, I was uh, told by the can chemist, at least that I talked to, can take up to a few years. Testing period, we already talked about, that's that pack test, can take up to a few years. And then you have to commercialize it. You have to make sure that your technology is going to work with your new resin, and that can take a couple of years. So given the complexity and the length of time required to develop something new, 
I think it's going to be really important as part of your conversation that you develop some kind of systematic and lasting approach toward evaluating CAN options. You're going to need to ask whether the alternatives are commercially available, technologically feasible, are the same or better in cost and performance, have an improved health and environmental profile, and then have the potential for lasting change. Because what you really don't want to do is have a manufacturer spend you know, eight, nine, ten years coming up with this new system that works in most regards, and then they change their manufacturing facilities, they change their chemistries, they test their products, and then you come back after six months once the new product is rolled out and say, you know, I forgot this one thing. I really want you to start over again. So coming up with something that's going to be lasting is going to be essential. And I think that's all I have. Thank you.